Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutt of HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Tuesday, the third day of May 2022. And today, let's talk about storm surge a little bit. And I could do this for an hour or two because this has really been sort of my specialty over the last 20 to 25 years. I've done storm surge education maps for the Corps of Engineers for a lot of coastal counties from Georgia to the Carolinas and even a couple of villages, they call them villages, East Rockaway and Freeport up in Long Island. Um, storm surge is deadly. It is the deadliest of the hazards historically. We think Galveston, we think other big storm surge events globally in the Bay of Bengal from cyclones that come into Bangladesh um, and it certainly causes a lot of damage. You know, the destructive power of water. You know, I say water made the Grand Canyon, you know, and it took a long time to do it, yes, but if it can make the Grand Canyon, it can be a problem for you and me on a daily basis. And if you get the right set of circumstances, i.e. a hurricane coming in, you can get a storm surge. So it's all part of this education that we're doing, this swift surge wind, inland flooding, and tornadoes. Again, we putting this on the map this year, literally, to get the word out. We're trying to rethink and redirect the thinking away from just categories. We don't want to ignore categories, but it's about the impacts. And the number one deadly impact is that one right there, surge. So today, we're going to talk about storm surge. I'll show you a few examples of some surge that we have captured over the years. First of all, National Hurricane Center's got a great storm surge overview page. It's kind of simple and it's kind of complex. You know, uh, the very simple side of it, storm surge is the wind pushing it upon, pushing upon a body of water. Uh, and on the other side, wherever that terminates, you get a rise in water. You know, if I had water in my hand and I went, whew, that would be storm surge blowing out of my hand. If I could blow it hard enough, that is storm surge. You get storm surge from oceans. Uh, your gulfs like the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, you know, you can get them off of bays, sounds, lakes, and rivers. Any body of water that can have wind blowing across it, uh, to the extent enough, you can pile it up on the other side to get storm surge. Now then, you start to get into the details of, well, how high could that storm surge be for me? Well, that gets very complex because it ultimately comes down to track, intensity, the ferocity of the eye wall, and all of those nuances, even three hours before landfall of the most intense hurricane, it's hard to know exactly who will see the worst impacts. Therefore, the best course of action is to just educate yourself about storm surge, your vulnerability to it, and then, you know, if you live in an evacuation zone, commit to evacuating now. Don't second guess and say, you know, we're going to wait. It might be a two. It could go to a three. Push that aside. Think impacts, not category. Don't let the category be the trigger. Let some of the videos I'm going to show you be the trigger and understand different hurricanes and tropical storm events can produce different surge values in the same spot year after year. It's not always going to be the same. So there's some good resources. I'll put a link to this in today's description of the video from the National Hurricane Center. Um, but also, these things right here, these public advisories, that's where the storm surge info is always located. This is from Laura, advisory number 27. We all remember, Laura, what a frightening, a huge hurricane event that was. Where is the storm surge info within the public advisory? Well, it's down here in the hazards affecting land section right there and you just need to look for it storm surge and it gives a description the combination of dangerous surge and the tide will cause normally dry areas near the coast to be flooded by rising waters moving inland from the shoreline a basic definition of storm surge for you in the case of Laura these are the different heights that were predicted by various and sundry computer models and experts from as little as two to four feet to as much as 20 feet. All of it was completely dependent upon the track, even a little wobble, three miles, two miles. A mile is 5,280 feet. One mile can make a big difference in who sees peak surge 
in certain hurricanes? Are you going to gamble on one mile in terms of your life? Your property? Well, if you're insured properly and you take mitigation measures seriously, you can mitigate most of the damage. In a case like Laura, though, a lot of that was unsurvivable, you know, both from a physical standpoint, your life, and a lot of property was swept away. You know, there's just some instances where you're not going to win no matter what you do, so you have to commit to evacuating. Um, one thing to point out, too, storm surge, as I said before, is the deadliest. And we think back, and they mention it here on this page, Ike, Katrina, Dennis, Isabel, and then getting farther back or further back in time, Camille, Audrey, the New England Hurricane of 38, and then the deadliest of them all, Galveston 1900, storm surge, definitely has the potential to be the deadliest of the impacts, so you need to take it very, very seriously. So it depends on where you are. You know, we look at our coastline of the United States, of the Western Basin, not just the U.S., but anywhere, these hurricanes roll off Africa, they come over, they make landfall wherever, maybe they come up the East Coast. You know, even Bermuda can get storm surge. Uh, you certainly get it in the Canadian Maritimes. You can get them into surges into Central America, into Mexico. Anywhere the land is next to the water, you can blow that water on shore if you blow the water hard enough. But it really matters where you live, the geography of the area makes a huge difference. And so as our first example comes to mind here, let's think about Ike. Way back in 2008, it was chugging along. It was going to make landfall up here, uh, coming right over Houston and Galveston, roughly something like that. Um, and this area to the northeast of the core was hammered, absolutely hammered, but not as the eye wall came in. It was a long time coming. It was like a day before I got there, this part of the coastline over here, even all the way over uh, to Mississippi, was seeing a rise in water because of the enormous wind field that was generated by Ike as it came up here. And I'm just going to show you. Let's just show you. Seeing, seeing is believing. Uh, here's a time lapse from our camera. This was when we used VHS tape. Yes, we did. We used an old color bullet cam and VHS tape to record it. This is 12 hours before landfall. And this is time lapse. This is Bermuda Beach, west of Galveston. And that's the surge coming in little by little. I'm going to scroll through to speed it up. You see the water level gradually increases. The background level comes up. And then on top of that are the waves. And eventually it got dark and we couldn't see much. And that little blue house got bulldozed and the water rose another several feet. Over on Bolivar Peninsula, it was almost 20 feet. And a lot of those houses in some of the areas of Gilchrist and Crystal Beach, of course, they were swept clean. So, you know, it's because of the shape of the coastline down here that the water was able to really get piled up. And that's going to be a lot different than, let's say, over here uh, along the North Carolina uh, Outer Banks where you get something like Dorian. Dorian in 2019 cut right across, just like this, something like, yeah, roughly. The eye went right over, that's like at the center part of the eye. And we had a very fast storm surge come up from Dorian off the Pamlico Sound. Here's what that looked like. This is when the eye was passing over. All right. So we had a much better quality camera now in 2019 than we did in 2008. This is a GoPro shot. This is Buxton, and north is basically behind the camera. South is in front of us here, and uh, the eye is sitting right over the area. In fact, the wind is blowing across. Let's see if I can get this to telestrate for me. The wind has been blowing this way, all right? So the sound over here has been blown out. It's kind of a reverse surge, right? So that's what happens uh, along the sound. And then you go to the next one, when it comes back, once we get our little bungee out of the way, look what happens. Unbelievable. This just took about an hour to really transform the onshore flow across the sound as the eye went by. The wind direction changed. Uh, Dorian was about a 90 mile per hour hurricane up here, and this is what it did. So geography absolutely matters as does mitigation. Look, it goes without saying, if you elevate your property, 
you know, like these houses are here, this one back here, you can ward off a lot of the damage. You're still going to get some problems. It's not perfect, and if you get a big enough surge, it's still going to knock your house over. Uh, but you elevate. You elevate, elevate, elevate as best you can. you got to live near the water. You do the best you can to be smart about it. All right, so one other example here real quick, uh, and that would be last year down here in uh, Lake Pontchartrain. So I showed you the Gulf, and we looked at the Atlantic and the Sound off of the Outer Banks of North Carolina. What about Lake Pontchartrain? Very vulnerable area. Uh, the wind blowing across this, whatever the direction may be, from Mandeville on the North Shore to the New Orleans uh, waterfront along the South Shore and all the points in between, especially over here in Laplace, you can get some really nasty surges. And that's what happened last year as Ida uh, came across, the center came across, the wind cutting across Lake Pontchartrain like this, funneled it and trapped it right there and we had a camera or three over in the Laplace area. And if you haven't seen this, well, here you go. So this is one of our live cams that we had. Lake-induced storm surge. This is Frenier, the Frenier landing area of Laplace off of Peavine Road. And we are looking generally south-southwest. This is early in the morning. The sun has just come up. The lake is starting to respond. It's a slow process, absolutely. But later in the day it really really ramps up and this is what that looked like look at this this is several hours later late afternoon the water came up about nine feet ten feet some spots you know it varies depending on the ground elevation but that is lake generated storm surge all right this was we saw this as it happened as we say we saw it live look at that the camera was ten feet above the ground and the waves are over the camera so you have your surge, but you also have waves on top of the surge that bulldoze stuff, that transport all kinds of debris. Let's see if we see anything float by just real quick in the video. Uh, sometimes you do. Just look at the, the ferocity of this, like right there. Let's let this play for a second. That is lakefront storm surge from Hurricane Ida. Um, so it just depends. It depends on where you are. There's one of those waves going right over the top of that camera there. Remarkable. We were able to watch this, we are able to monitor this, and see it as it happens. One more quick one, and this one is over in terms of just how bad it can get. Mexico Beach, 2018. Michael came in, the core down here, and boy was it violent. Um, no run-up like Ike, 12 hours ahead of time. No. Two hours before landfall. Well, I'll just let it sort of speak for itself. Two hours before landfall... We come in and we're going to set up this GoPro to augment the live cam. We already had a live cam there, but we wanted the GoPro to back it up and we'd go get that GoPro later. This is what it looked like. This is about two hours before the worst started coming in. And there we are. We're at ground zero and there's not a single solitary trace of storm surge. No overwash, nothing. So this is a violent, rapid storm surge comparatively to Ike, which was a much longer duration event, equally as destructive at Bolivar, but it took forever, seemingly, compared to this. As we scroll through, there's 11, uh, that's one hour after we set it up. One hour. I'm sorry, two hours after we set it up. There's the eye wall starting to come in. Two hours later, the eye wall comes in, move ahead, still no sign of surge, a lot of wind damage. Story for another day, a lot of lawsuits for that, because they were like, hey, it's all surge, but, I mean, look, that's 11.56 a.m., roofs coming off two cans. We'll get to the wind stuff tomorrow, but uh, no sign of surge yet at this particular location. Depending on where you were in Mexico Beach, there was surge by this point. But the water comes up, it's very violent, and you can see that here. I'll just let it play. Look at that. That is a violent rapid storm surge driven by a Cat 5 hurricane, which a lot of people the night before were dismissing as, yeah, they always say it's going to be bad, and then it's not. Uh, luckily, pretty much everybody evacuated Mexico Beach, and there were only, and you know, all deaths are uh, inexcusable. I hate to see it, but luckily the deaths were very, very low, because I think people woke up and like, oops, and they got the heck out of there 
because they could. They could. If you were on Bolivar, you couldn't during Ike in 2008, by the way. So that's what a very violent surge looks like. Um, the building moving across the road right there. Look at that. That's it. So storm surge, a very, very uh, serious um, hazard from hurricanes. We evacuate because of storm surge. There are watches and warnings specifically for storm surge. There are a lot of tools for storm surge monitoring, like I said, that are out there when a hurricane is threatening. So um, just to kind of summarize, at the end of the day, it's all up to you. You know, you live along this vulnerable coastline of the beautiful U.S. coast or the Caribbean or elsewhere. It doesn't matter. If you live next to the water, it can surge over you if the wind is strong enough. And so you have to develop a plan. What am I going to do when that event happens? What is, what is my plan? Um, you got to have flood insurance, homeowners insurance, and wind insurance does not cover storm surge damage. And flood insurance, depending on where you live, that can be expensive these days. It's tough. You want to live next to the gorgeous coastline of our beautiful planet. There will come times where you're going to have to deal with coastal storm surges. Uh, and in the U.S. anyway, we have quite a robust watch warning system, a lot of mitigation um, practices in place to uh, ward off storm surge. But, you know, you can't stop it all. You can't stop all the water. Uh, it'll go somewhere else if you do. It'll affect somebody else. So... Um, reach out to your local emergency management office. I talked about this yesterday. Find out if you are vulnerable to storm surge. You know, if you can look out and see water, that's a pretty big clue. But there are areas where surge can come in, you know, far from land. You know, we think about what Ike did. That surge spread 10 to 15 miles inland in some cases. So um, it's something to take very, very seriously. I wanted to show those vivid examples to just kind of wake you up, make sure you... You know, that's, it's a real thing, storm surge. So take it seriously uh, and heed those warnings and evacuation orders. They are there to keep you alive, not to make your life miserable. I know it stinks. My family evacuates not for surge. It's just the inconvenience of dealing with a hurricane in Wilmington. Yes, we do get hurricanes, even where I live. I'm not immune either. And yes, evacuation stinks. But in the case of surge... It's there to save your life. All right. Don't forget, we're on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We are supported, uh, crowdfunded through Patreon. Get the Patreon app or go on patreon.com and search Hurricane Track to find out how you can support our project and become literally a part of it. What we do with our Patreon and how we connect all of our uh, supporters together is pretty remarkable. All right. So there you go. Tomorrow, I'll take a look at wind. Uh, you know, that seems to get the big headline, 150 mile per hour hurricane. Um, these other hazards seem to sort of get lost when you get those big headlines. And the wind is what drives the category, by the way. We'll talk about that too on tomorrow's update when we discuss the second of our acronym letters of SWIFT. And that's the letter W. That'll be wind. All right. Thanks as always for tuning in. I hope you learned something today. Uh, questions or whatever, hit me up in the comments, send me an email, and um, I'll be glad to answer those if I can. Or if I can't, I'll point you in the right direction. Uh, again, MarkSouthHurricaneTrack.com. I'll be back with more for you tomorrow.